any case, uh, welcome to uh, Stanford's uh, EE380, uh, the Computer Systems uh, Colloquium uh, for uh, uh, 2020 fall. And um, our uh, uh, speaker today is going to talk about Purple Air. Now, you may or may not remember, but uh, uh, California in particular uh, has uh, spent a great deal of time uh, in a blanket of smoke. Uh, living here in uh, Northern California is a little bit like living in the middle of a fireplace uh, these days. And uh, one of the ways in which uh, uh, many of us track the, uh, the uh, problems of the conflagration uh, was to track the uh, air quality. And Purple Air has come up with a uh, marvelous uh, mechanism to uh, essentially uh, crowdsource the sensors. And uh, today's speaker uh, is going to tell us a little bit about what they do and how they've done it and what sort of success they've seen. Um, it's, a, um, it's a great thing. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I bought into the, uh, into the whole thing. I have on order, because things are back ordered these days, a pair of, uh, of sensors, which uh, I'm looking forward to receiving and then placing on the network along with everyone else. Um, in any case, uh, um, Adrian, our, the CEO, is uh, going to uh, tell us a little bit about this very small company out in the middle of Utah, which has done wonderful things. Adrian, the, the, the screen is yours, so to speak. Thank you. Hello, Dennis, and um, thank you for having me um, and for the interest in Purple Air. Um, I know we've seen a lot of interest from California due to the wildfires, and um, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about Purple Air, how we started and, and what we do. Um, Purple Air is a, an air quality monitoring network, and it's built on a new generation of low-cost Internet of Things sensors, which really just means um, devices that communicate to the Internet and um, upload data to the cloud. So um, Purple Air started in about 2015, the end of 2015. Uh, I was curious about the gravel pit that we that's behind our house and how much dust was coming out of it because every day I would watch the dust blow over Bluffdale and it seemed like a lot of dust. And I said to myself, hey, this is 2015. There has to be a device that I can use to measure the air quality. And um, being an engineer with some you know, hardware and surface mount and programming background, I decided to try to make my own. And the picture on here in the top left is, is actually some of the early sensors with the control boards that we used. And uh, the top right picture is the bowl design that we used initially to um, house the sensor and make it resilient against the environment. And as you go around on that, you see some of the latest to the, where you see in the middle what our sensor looks like nowadays. Um, we had no local government sensors um, apart from 20 miles away in the central Salt Lake City. And our desire was to share data openly and make it easy to view and to, to look at on a map. Um, and so in the beginning, to um, we didn't know what the sensors did or what they meant, and so we gave away about 80 sensors to volunteers who joined the network through Facebook and other um, sort of channels, and um, we gave them those early ones away. Uh, the sensor was then, we sent three of them to be tested by the AQ SPEC program, and um, also other, uh, like the University of Utah, they also were testing our sensor re very early on in the beginning. And basically it's those, that testing that really led to the explosion that we see now because the test came back very positive. So uh, Purple Air is an, what we call an end-to-end -end service. What makes us different is that we provide the way of storing the data and the way of viewing the data. Uh, a lot of sensors that you might buy off the shelf just have, you just get the sensor and you don't have any way of sharing that data or recording it over time. So we provide um, the IoT connected sensors, the data storage, 
an API for people to access the data as well, and a map for people to view it. Um, another very important part of what we do is our partner application ecosystem, which is uh, basically people that write applications that, let's say, an iOS application for iPhone or an Android application, uh, that they will put onto the, the various um, stores and uh, then, then you know, share, share their thing with people. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very important, the all-round end-to-end side of it. So purple sensors, they measure uh, and report PM1, PM2.5, and PM10. We use a laser counter, which uh, uses um, a laser beam to count and estimate the particles that they're seeing in the air, the size and the count of particles in six different size bins, as they call it, uh, from 0 0.3 microns up to 10 microns in size. Now, there was a potential question around the influence of humidity on, on the readings. And so we uh, included a temperature, humidity, and pressure sensor in case there was this um, influence that we could then correct the data. Um, we use a BME 280 for that. Um, we, it's also very important to mention that we don't do any pre-processing of data on the sensor. And what that means is that the firmware itself is designed to just quite simply um, pick up the uh, raw values and if it's noisy or if there's any other kinds of influence going on, we upload the data as is so that we leave that pre-processing to you later on. So if you wanted to low pass filter it or do some kind of fancy data analytics on it, uh, you can. Um, then one of the reasons for that is you couldn't undo processing um, if we did it on the census. So we try to make the data as uh, unmanipulated as possible. So the laser counter, the sensor is based around this, the heart of it is this PMS 5003. Um, I know we got interrupted on the network connection here. And so if I go back to the previous slide and I'll finish up on that, uh, and, and that's what purple air sensors measure. And I was talking about not doing any pre-processing of the data <clears throat> on the sensor because if you do any pre-processing on the firmware, you cannot undo it later. So we upload the data as it is. It might be a bit noisy. It might pick up whatever it is that the sensors um, have going on. It could be no electrical, electrical noise. It could be insects in the sensor, whatever it might be. And we upload that raw data to the internet so that you can choose to do your processing on it, like load pass filtering or whatever it might be after the fact. So the heart of a, a purple air sensor is a device that's made by a company called Plan Tower, and it's a PMS5003. Our indoor sensors use the PMS1003, but the PA2 uses the 5003. Um, they basically use lasers to uh, reflect light off the particles that are in the air that's being sucked through the device. And the um, particle counts, the, the estimated particle counts are used to calculate an estimated particle mass concentration in micrograms. Um, now, in that process of taking what they estimate to be the number of particles and converting it into a mass concentration, you have to know what the density of those particles might be. Now, to do the, the conversion, they, they uh, use what they've determined to be the average or uh, typical density of particles in the wild, which can be something like 2.6 or 2.8 um, grams per centimeter cubed. And it's fair to say that wildfire smoke is actually a density of around 1.5 grams per centimeter cubed. So the uh, microgram values that the sensor outputs could have an offset that is, that is basically uh, effect, um, influenced by the exact uh, density of the particles that it is seeing. So we also uh, get two values out of the laser counter. One is called CF1 and the other one is called ATM. And according to the manufacturer, the CF1 is meant to be used in controlled environments like indoors where you have air conditioning and other kinds of um, uh, controls on the air quality or on the air itself. And the ATM is meant to be used for outdoor environments uh, for atmospheric conditions. And so if you see CF1 and ATM type of 
units or, or uh, deno denom um, like qualifiers on the data fields, that's what they are for. Um, the problem map is one of the cornerstones of what we do, uh, and that is how you can share the data and how you can view the data uh, from the network of sensors. And um, the users will get their sensor and then you will register it on our website, which will place it on the map. The device, the sensor itself is connected to Wi-Fi and it reports every two minutes. Um, the, and those two minute readings is what you would be seeing on the map if you choose real time. Now the purple air map is also free to use and uh, you can get real time, you can get 10 minute average, you can get a bunch of different presentations or, or averaging periods of the data. And you can also choose different data layers. So you'll be able to see humidity, you'll be able to see temperature, you'll be able to see all these different uh, values that the sensor outputs, including the raw particle counts and the um, different ATM CF1 um, values that you can view on the map. So over the years, while we've been working on, on this, um, we actually uh, have learned a couple of things about what people want. Um, people want to know what the air quality is right now. They don't want to know what it was like an hour ago because they feel like it might not be representative of what they're being exposed to at that very moment. They also want to know what it is right here, right where they are, where they live. Um, and in the beginning, we had those 80 sensors that we gave away. Someone said to, to me, you know, I, I know you've got a sensor just around the corner at the school from where I live, but I want one outside my house. And so that's when we started realizing that we had to make them available to purchase because it didn't make sense for us to place one for free um, and, and have one so close by. We wouldn't be able to cover much area if we did that. So we started selling them. The other thing that's important, that is critically important, is the accuracy. It must be trusted. People must trust the data. They must trust the values coming out the sensor. Otherwise, it will, it will not be useful. And so that's where the testing with the AQ-SPEC program came in. And also um, the other testing that was done by many other um, institutions like universities around the world. Um, and the confirmation of those um, the, of the readings from all of those different sources has really helped to make it trusted. The other thing that's important is it must be easy to access. You must be able to see the data on any device at any time. And so we take a lot of care to try to make the map and our website um, compatible on all devices, including phones. And so you will be able to um, read the data and see the data on any device. And the other thing, um, the biggest thing that we've learned is just how much people care. Um, unfortunately, that image is covering up part of the, some of the, the word people, but that's people. And people really care about clean air. I kind of thought in the beginning that, you know, Utah is a, uh, it's commonly known as a red state. Um, it, people here that's on the seal of Utah is, the, is industry. And we kind of thought that people would brush it off, like, oh, it's just smog, it's like air pollution, get used to it, get over it, you know, move on. Um, but actually here in Utah, we got a very big footprint of sensors because people really do care about air quality. No matter who you are, you want to be breathing good air. You don't want to be breathing diesel smoke and, and dust and, and all sorts of pollution because everyone understands that it's bad for you. So people really do care about it. So there's a couple of challenges in what we do. Um, one of them is uh, that left-hand picture there is meant to be a data tidal wave. And it is a massive, massive amount of data. I mean, we are dealing with 14 billion records so far and counting um, from our collection of, net, of sensors. So you have to be able to store a large volume of data. You have to be able to um, access it. You have to be able to analyze it. And that in itself presents a significant challenge, not just in costs of storing that data and collecting it, but in analyzing it. Like an analytical um, processes on such a huge volume of data poses its own set of problems. And then the other thing that's really come central in what we do is educating users. And one of the main areas of education is 
the difference between our network and regulatory sensors. Like, why is Purple A reading this and then Air Now is reading that? And the EPA gets phone calls from people who are asking these questions and concerned about it, and they think that all sorts of stuff is going on in the background to make this, you know, that the government is hiding something or something. But it's fair to say that the regulatory network was really created to uh, monitor the effects of legislation, monitor the effects of things like clean air rules on vehicles, and also to do that over weeks, months, and years. It was not really designed to tell you what the air quality is right now to make you able to make a decision about whether you should go cycling now, if you should go running now, if you should go somewhere else or let the kids play outside. And so the differences between the two networks really become apparent in the desire to make these types of decisions and uh, real-time information is very different to averaged and regulatory network. Another thing that's worth pointing out is that the difference between the government sensors and ours is something like the government sensors need to stand up to scrutiny. If you take a company to court about polluting, you need to have that data really um, rig rigorously um, validated. You have to have the sensors that collect the data uh, calibrated by uh, you know, qualified engineers and, and regularly, and it has to stand up to scrutiny, documentation, all of that becomes very important. So the purpose of the data and the purpose of the network is very important. So our goals are to manufacture high quality, low cost air quality sensors. Generally those two terms, high quality and low cost, don't always come in the same um, sentence. So it's quite a, a tough um, goal to, to achieve that. And um, we also want to provide the map for real-time decision-making um, and uh, sharing the data. Um, we're also intending on creating localized and global data air quality sets. Um, if you want to look at the idea of comparing air quality in New York compared to London, compared to Delhi, wherever you might be looking at air quality, what makes Purple Air kind of unique and special is that we have the same technology deployed in all of these places. The same sensor in working in the same way, reporting to the same system, which makes it very easy to compare directly. Whereas if you look at um, British air quality indexes and British air quality methods of collecting air quality data might differ from US, Canada, India, all of these different places have different standards, they have different methods, and, and so it can be hard to compare like for like across the world. We make that possible. Supplement, uh, we also want to supplement regulatory air quality networks. So for instance, the EPA likes Purple Air because we help them to fill in the gaps between their sensors. We help them to understand what it might be like uh, where they don't have sensors because we have sensors where they have sensors so they can get a ground uh, comparison of a baseline and compare what ours are reading compared to theirs. And then that helps them to, let's say, calibrate and fill in the gaps between their sensors. And then the other thing that Purple Air uh, has, one of, another one of our goals or one thing that we're good at is getting people interested in air quality. Um, the South Coast and um, other groups down in California like the Coalition for Clean Air in LA, they liked the fact that Purple Air gave them this opportunity and this ability to start getting people interested in air quality again because as the years went on from the 60s and 70s where there was horrific air quality and things got better and cleaner, it became less um, obvious in people's minds and it would take more of a, a back seat in, in, uh, in all everyday life. And so people started sort of forgetting about air quality and we helped to make that more uh, present in people's minds. Today we have over 13,000 sensors on the map um, and they're used by anyone from private concerned or interested citizens to schools, universities, uh, non-profit groups like, as I mentioned, the Coalition for Clean Air in LA or Clean Air Carolina in North Carolina. Um, and it's used by government organizations as well from air regulators to um, the fire and smoke map on air now. And it's also used by news agencies or other um, uh, organizations that might report on weather and air quality and so they find it uh, beneficial to use our data to help them to understand what they can tell their users about air quality. 
a recent addition to the Purple Air um, ecosystem, which we're quite proud of, is the Purple Air uh, part partnership with the EPA on the fire and smoke map on air now. Um, it is really a, a very big achievement to have that level of recognition, and we're very proud of that. So the EPA did a big study where they compared readings across thousands of purple air sensors to thousands of EPA sensors across the country, and they came up with a conversion that would allow them to compare or to, to output numbers that were more in line with the official government sensors. And, and they're using that now on the uh, fire and smoke map on the EPA's uh, in our website. So what the EPA does with the purple air data that they get from us, the raw data, is they'll apply a QA and QC process to it, which is basically selecting which sensors they believe are in good condition and reporting accurate uh, numbers. And then they will apply that conversion factor to that data and then they also apply what they, what's called the now cast method, um, which is just how they process the uh, real time readings into more or less like a an averaged reading that's that uh, I think it's about a three hour average with recent or latest data having a, a weighted kind of influence on those numbers. And so they then take those numbers, uh, the output of that that process, and they put it onto their fire and smoke map and they do some uh, graphics to try to estimate where the smoke plumes are. And the idea behind that is to try to help people get a filtered and, and uh, regulatory grade or regulatory kind of, um, I wouldn't say endorsed, but they're trying to just make it that people can uh, see the smoke plumes in a more trusted way. So on the horizon, uh, we have, um, work that we're doing in the background on firmware, on making the sensors, easy, sensors easier to configure and uh, more friendly to, to the user, user experience. We're also adding new features to our API that allows access to the data and uh, more fields and improvements to that over time as can be expected. We're also working in the background on infrastructure upgrades which will give us new capabilities with how the sensors track the pollution and different types of pollution, uh, and also um, more flexibility with that. So we're, we're working on background upgrades to our infrastructure for all of that kind of stuff. We're also working on new sensors. We're doing some kind of experimentation with ozone and VOC sensors, uh, which are quite commonly asked for. And so we're um, doing some trials and stuff on those types of sensors right now. And we're also looking at new designs of our devices to make them easier for us to make, uh, cheaper to make, faster to make, which will all be um, translated into savings for the end users at the end of the day. Um, people talk about our sensors being a little bit more expensive. And yes, they are a bit more expensive because of all of these extras in the background, like the map and the data storage and um, the cost related to providing all of that, that service is pretty significant. But we're hoping to provide a cheaper sensor that will help um, less privileged communities in the future and be, be able to make the sensors more prolific. Um, now in this picture, you can actually see a little uh, secret uh, preview, if you want to call it that, of what we're calling our spaceship design, which has got a bunch of LEDs around it that, that uh, glow with the air quality color. And uh, that's something that we're hoping to be able to offer in limited current quantities pretty soon. Um, and uh, yeah, the spaceship design. People like LEDs, like they like um, lights. And uh, that's the thank you for, for having me and um, I'll obviously be happy to answer any questions that you might have and uh, um, thank you for listening. So Adrian, this is this is uh, true, truly cool because uh, you know, what you've done is you've taken a collection of essentially off-the-shelf parts, put them together in a special way, and uh, put a whole bunch of them out to be uh, uh, put on the map. And I think that's that's really wonderful. Are you looking at other things that you could perhaps uh, handle in the same way? You know, the, the ozone side of it, yes. I mean, we take our own flavor and apply it to, to a sensor that's already available. And we, we're actually looking at um, the Aeroqual S900, 
Uh, and we take our, we, it's like kind of going back to our roots where we take the dollar store, literally it's a dollar store bowl, and we make the um, Stevenson screen improvised housing for it. And so, um, yeah, we, we're applying our methods, um, our construction methods, like for instance, the fact that we use a PVC end cap for the housing for our PA2, and we're um, adding more devices and we're adding more uh, types of pollution to our um, what we're measuring. Mm -hmm. Well, did you, are you, are you also exploring and see if you can uh, increase the range of things you can build sensors for? I, you know, I was thinking uh, uh, possibly even a seismic sensor or a, uh, well, a seismic sensor, for example. Right, so it's a very um, good question. And um, in the very beginning, when I was building the website and the, the back end for that, we made it flexible enough that we would be able to add uh, more uh, parameters or different types of sensors into that. So for instance, if we had the ability to connect, to collect noise, for instance, noise pollution is another big subject around the world. And if we had a noise sensor, if we had a seismic sensor, we would be able to feed it into the PA2 and have it upload the data over Wi-Fi and, and have it indexed and easily create a new layer on the map for that type of thing. So I guess we've built into the backend systems and the PA2 this ability to uh, interface with new sensors. And um, seismic would be a little bit different because the way that the sensor is mounted, you would have to have it um, with a pole into the ground and something that's a slightly different mounting strategy. And the same is true for things like wind speed and wind direction. You would have to have a wind sensor mounted up high on the roof. Um, you know, in more uh, clear airflow. Um, noise would also be a little bit trickier to measure because you're going to have to, um, you know, basically uh, mount it in a way that it's not shielded from noise of certain types. And so, so there's, there's intricacies involved with measuring different types of uh, things. And, and we would have to um, consider those if we were to incorporate those sensors. I can think of one that would be uh, a great uh, joy to have around here, and that is a uh, an e-field measurement device, which could be used to determine whether or not locally there's uh, being uh, dry lightning, since that's a major cause of fires in the uh, Northern California area. Yes, and that's a very interesting idea, and something like that um, would be less susceptible to the mounting location because we have our sensors mounted up under the eave of the roof or on the side of the house or somewhere else. And so um, a sensor like that would probably go very well with this. Um, the new designs that we're working on are expandable in that it's got a, a port that you could plug things into, including something like a more accurate temperature and, and humidity sensor that might not be influenced by the, the uh, latent heat given off by the sensor itself. So an e-field plug-in um, module might be definitely a, a good thing for us to look at implementing in the future. Yeah, I think it's really, really amazing the things you can do. Once you, once you, 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 have, you have a mechanism for reporting data back and uh, you can build uh, all manner of different uh, sensors which uh, fit into that, uh, that particular uh, framework. And I'm, I'm just amazed that no one has, uh, has uh, has done it widely before. This is at least my first encounter with this. Um, sure. How, how large is the one company? Of, one of the reasons that maybe people haven't done it before is it's quite difficult to do. You know, you've got a lot of expense to incur with developing online systems. Uh, people might think, oh, just you know, put a website out there and have a database, but uh, it's it's a lot more complicated than that because you've got. Um, code, you've got uh, volume of data, you've got real-time systems that have to be online. If, they, if you go down for a couple of minutes, you're going to lose a whole lot of data. So it's really very complicated to create an overall, you know, the hardware, the online systems, the databases, everything behind it. Yeah. So how large a company do you have? Oh, sorry, what's the question? How many people? Oh, um, yeah, so right now Purple Air, has, we, we've got about 25 people, I would say, um, at the moment that, that work every day on making sensors, on support, and on the admin side. Okay, and uh, it's privately held, I assume? Yes, um, we are privately held, we're also self-funded, so 
since the beginning, um, you know, in the very beginning, we had some friends who helped us to uh, put together resources to make the first 80 sensors that we gave away. Um, but since we started selling the sensors, we have been completely self-sufficient and funded from the sales of the sensors. Okay. Now, as an owner operator of these, though mine have yet, or yet to arrive, I know you have a backlog. Uh, the, um, the, the, the other question is, what in the future will I be able to, uh, to get from you, purchase, that will allow you to continue to uh, grow and uh, expand your offerings? So apart from the sensors as they are that we sell and new versions that might come out and new types of things to plug into it, like the e-field measuring and, and stuff that, that uh, we might develop in the future, um, we're also looking at other ways to uh, generate what's called revenue streams, I guess, like uh, premium services on the website that might help us to sus be, become sustainable. Uh, for instance, we always want to maintain an element of free access to our map that um, people that haven't got any subscription or membership of any sort will be able to view the map and get data to help them to deal with disasters like the wildfires or just decide when to go running. Um, but we also might be providing um, more advanced features like let's say uh, notifications or a longer ability to view longer history of data or animations or something like that that might um, be uh, available to subscribers for a monthly fee that will help us to uh, exist and to survive um, as well as commercial agreements where if you're using the data in a certain way and you're using the API that you you would be uh, subscribing to get access to that data to help us to survive. I think it's wonderful. Um, I, uh, I don't have any further questions. I appreciate your taking the time to describe the, uh, uh, the, the work that you've been doing. And uh, I'm waiting for my, um, my versions of the uh, sensors uh, to arrive in the, uh, in the uh, FedEx or whatever uh, very soon. I'm, uh, I'm anxious to get them up. And um, I'm told uh, right at the moment that we are, uh, that the uh, fire that, uh, the glass fire in Napa that is not far from where I am, uh, is again stirring and that the air quality is going down. And so I'll be checking purpleair.com uh, uh, to find out what's actually happening. And for that, I, I really appreciate uh, the work that you've been doing. Thank you very much. Well, Dennis, I want to also just close by saying um, thank you to you and to all of our supporters, because without all of our sensor hosts and people that buy sensors contributing towards our existence, we really would not be here. Purple Air consists of, of us in the office here and everyone that hosts a sensor and everyone that looks at the system. And the other thing that I want to mention is that benefiting from, uh, you know, increased sales or, or like uh, proliferation of people viewing the map during something like the wildfires in California gives us very mixed feelings. The success of it is, is, a, is a great feeling and then the tragedy of what's happening there, the loss of property, the loss of human life um, and the untold loss of, of um, creatures and, and uh, you know, millions of insects and animals affected by this. It is a real tragedy and we really feel for what's, what's going on in California um, and has also in Australia, places like that, it is a real tragedy. And what gives us um, the ability to actually um, sleep at night is the fact that people are very grateful for what we're doing because we're helping them to understand the disaster and to understand its scope a bit better. And we get letters of thank you all the time. So we want to really acknowledge that it is a terrible tragedy, it's a disaster, and people are suffering and the animals are suffering, and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really terrible. Okay, and so I thank you very much. Uh, how many continents are you on? I think we're on almost all of them except for Antarctica because uh, we, we have sensors all over the world now, and uh, it might even change. We might even have one in the Arctic at some point, but okay. uh, yes. Well, I'll, 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 I have a friend who's there. I'll uh, make a suggestion that they get one. Sure, and the sensors do perform very well in extreme cold, so it would be interesting to see how they handle that type of cold. That uh, sounds like a very good test to run. 
Okay. Well, we would be happy to donate some for that purpose too. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the uh, for your time, and uh, um, we'll uh, look forward to uh, chatting with you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dennis.